I had no idea about this whole world. I mean, how would these design look like? How, how does a temple of, in 1250 look like, or the city of Troy? You know, a lot of this, though, was, was what the production design people came up with, and they had to combine research with imagination. It is a heroic story, and so the whole setting is glamorized. You're watching an epic film, and you've got to have these epic proportions in order to make this such a grand film. You have your moments on these productions where it, you get overwhelmed by the, by the art direction and by the set design. The huge gates open, and all these people are cheering, and they're throwing petals at us. I mean, I had goosebumps. It's just one of these things. You, you really think you're there. Heinrich Schliemann is a German explorer who excavated uh, Troy in the 19th century. He says that when he was eight years old, he was given a book, a children's history, which showed the burning city of Troy and Aeneas escaping from it. And his father explained to him that it was an artist's reconstruction. Nobody really knew anything about Troy. And, and Schliemann tells us in his own autobiography, at that moment I said to my father, when I'm grown up, I'm going to go and find Troy. He almost literally set off with Homer in one hand and a spade in the other to prove that the world of Homer had existed. Schliemann began excavating at the site that we now call Troy. And he said to the world, yes, this is it. I have found the Troy of the Trojan War, where Priam lived, where the heroes came and fought. With a project like this, you've got to do a lot of research. It was important for Wolfgang that the film was authentic, as authentic as possible. Nigel Phelps he had an enormous knowledge about the time, and his, his first drawings were just beautiful. And they were digging themselves into all kinds of books and research material and British Museum. I was just fascinated by they, what they came up with. Nigel Phelps is... Uh, view on it was that he'd rather create something of, of tremendous visual interest rather than you can actually get slightly bogged down with um, historical research and things like that. You look at pictures of what, what contemporary historians think Troy probably looked like and it's quite a bit smaller than what we have and quite a bit less majestic. But for the movie, it's, it, it makes it more powerful and, it, and frankly it makes it more beautiful that you have this glorious city. I realised that the reality of the period was that the buildings and everything was very small. And so what I've done is mix up several different cultures of the period, the scale of the Egyptians and some of the forms that the Mycenaeans created. But to get the big landscapes, the big epic sweeps, and you figure out where, where in the world are you going to be doing this. We started the construction process for Troy in Malta, in the middle of the Mediterranean. Uh, a film like Troy, being an historical project, uh, you can't get anything. You can't get props, you can't get furniture, uh, nothing exists. So absolutely everything you see on the screen has to be designed, budgeted, created, argued over. So here we are behind the streets, behind the back lot. This historical accuracy then goes out the window is that you know the largest sculpture that was found over that period was 10 feet tall you know and we've got to have like 40 foot statues we had to create our own language with the art of the place we were um, combining all these different sort of cultural references the world that we have in Troy you know a more religious place as opposed to the Spartan and the Mycenaean cultures which they don't have any art they don't have any sculptures we had over 115 columns there was probably 20 different types, the largest of which were 40 feet high, and probably the smallest were about 15 foot high. The set really, apart from structure, columns, and, and uh, you know, geometrical lines, was, was very much about texture. We used a lot of real surfaces, which existed in Malta, that we, we took rubber molds from. 
in between scenes you might be doing something like changing your shoelace and you look down and you think no one will ever see that grouting but someone's actually paid attention to that and the amount of effort and detail that goes into it it's um you kind of f feel a bit guilty most sets that i've been on things will look good from about 10 feet away which means they'll look okay on camera but when you get up close you can see that it's you know that's fiberglass i mean i would be standing right next to it and looking at these blocks of stone and they, they still look completely real it was completely fascinating walking onto the set of Troy in Malta and seeing what in my archaeological way I think of as Troy 6, which is the way the archaeologists refer to the Troy of the Late Bronze Age, before my eyes. To Morocco, for the, the scale parts of the film, meaning we needed to have a very broad beach where a thousand ships could land. We had to make the decision right when there was the potential for the Iraq conflict. And then because of the political situation and the danger to go to Morocco, the only real alternate situation we found was Mexico on the other side of the world. Fortunately, I had a coffee table book on Baja and there was a, an aerial picture of these, this fantastic looking beach. Because it felt as if it were a beach that hadn't really been touched. Progress really hasn't come yet, or civilization to that extent. I mean, it was really stunning and in many ways much, much better for telling our story in the sense that it looks much more like the Aegean. I mean, there were two issues. One, the environmental issues. I mean, first of all, we're working on what is pretty much a pristine beach. The uh, entire coast of Mexico is an endangered turtle habitat. So to allow us to, to build our boats on the beach, to have our encampments, to occupy such a large stretch of beach, we implemented our own turtle incubation nursery. We've been able to um, release more baby turtles into the ocean because of you know, the precautions that we've taken. Because of the rush with the change from uh, Morocco to Mexico, um, there really wasn't enough time spent on just finding out exactly what happens to that beach. It was never the same beach on any particular given day, really. It changed all the time. Early one morning, so like, get down the beach straight away, and two of the ships were, like, teetering on the edge of this, like, 10-foot bank of sand. It was just, like, 100 foot of the beach had washed away overnight. Logistically a nightmare, but as a location, you know, it was, it was fantastic. We've built 500 foot of wall, and for the most part, it on, it's on average 40 foot tall. It's 60 feet in the central bit where we have the 40 foot gates. It's endless, and Wolfgang would have to sit down and say, this is what you'll see. Digitally, it's going to be extended by miles. As a viewer, we should have the same reaction as Helen does when she first sees it. You know, she's looking around, you should be filled in awe. Actually, there have been challenges with weather everywhere. And it seems just when we sort of get a, a foot up or a leg up, so to speak, something happens like the, the hurricane in Mexico. We just wrapped first unit Friday night, did some inserts on Saturday, and we were just about to shoot an additional week of second unit um, when Hurricane Marty blew through uh, the Baja Peninsula and pretty much hit Cabo San Lucas directly. You can see the devastation all around you. It worked out that the, the cheapest way of doing all of the, you know, these other three days of shooting that needed to happen was to rebuild the whole thing again. was a really pivotal uh, design challenge in the film. I think it's 12 days the Greeks had to build it. If you apply logic to it, the only building material the Greeks would have had would have been burnt ships and the vestiges of the Trojan defences that were left behind. Bob Ringwood came in with a very uh, intriguing reference of a gorilla um, that had been made 
out of car tires. I also had a picture of this decomposed ship. It just burnt and charred and it just looked fantastic. And it was pretty simple to look at the two things. It was like, hmm. Well, Paul Catlin came up with what was the best one. And the sculptor, Martin Smeaton, took the sketch and came up with a like a 12-inch maquette that was just fantastic. And then we embarked on making a full-size sculpt in polystyrene. It's 42 feet high. And the other thing with having this sort of informal design was that you could have lots of different doors that would open in it. The whole thing weighs about now 12 tons. One of the driving factors was the fact that it had to be dismantleable to transport from England to Malta and then take it apart again and then from Malta to Mexico. At about the time when the Greek tradition felt the Trojan War had happened, there does seem to be a stage of the city of Troy that was attacked and was destroyed by enemy action. So there is the possibility that that is the single event that was behind the Greek tradition of the war. Equally, there's a possibility that there was more than one Trojan War. In a society where they built everything out of stone, now how do you burn the city? We had to integrate a lot of wooden aspects, as many wooden aspects as we could, into the design. So we've got a lot of market stalls and um, wooden scaffolding and awnings and lean-tos. So far as an exterior purpose-rigged fire job for a movie is concerned, I, I personally can't think of anything bigger, perhaps since Gone with the Wind. Hopefully ours will be slightly different to that, because this will be controlled and we can turn it off. We have five separate points throughout the back of the set where we have a liquid propane gas tanks. We get a little bit jittery when we see people, you know, having a quiet cigarette leaning on a 500 litre propane tank. Wolfgang rolled the shot for two, three minutes, then it was cut and the Maltese firemen ran in onto the set and douse the door down. I mean, it was absolutely breathtaking that the way the horse caught. Bernard Shaw said, no one has satisfactorily placed a boundary between myth and history. So you can see the enormous attractions, both of the story, the historical story, plus the myth. Doing a movie on this, this scale with these uh, thousands of people, with these uh, sets that were almost unheard of, to shoot that in Malta, Yay! in Mexico afterwards, and you pull it off because of one reason, you have a fantastic project.